OK, uh, today's lecture four. I was a teeny bit rushed at the end of the last lecture, so I'll recap a little bit what I was saying right at the end. Uh, so if you now recall, if you have a d-dimensional quantum state, it's called a q-dit, the most popular case being when d is 2, and it's called a q-bit. Uh, but in general, such a quantum state uh, has d amplitudes, potentially complex amplitudes. And the sum of the squares of the magnitudes of these amplitudes are, is 1. Okay, so any vector with these properties is a legitimate quantum state. And uh, this funny symbol means that a psi is the name of a column vector. And the associated uh, row vector uh, with complex conjugates is psi in the opposite brackets. And so this means the matrix product between the row vector and the column vector, which is the inner product of psi with itself, which is indeed the squared length of the vector. OK, so what they're talking about at the very end was about um, the fact, which is uh, normally when you just do a you know, normal measurement or the standard measurement, uh, it you know, tells you 1, 2, 3 up to d, with each of these as the probabilities, alpha 1 magnitude squared up to alpha d magnitude squared. But it's also physically possible to do something called measuring in another orthonormal basis. Okay. And uh, you can build a measuring device corresponding to your favorite orthonormal basis, uh, you know, let's say u1 through ud of d-dimensional space. By the way, sometimes when I say orthonormal basis, I like do this, like somehow this is my hand signal for an orthonormal basis. It's supposed to look like three unit vectors, which are orthogonal. Uh, so you can build a device which quote unquote measures in this basis. And uh, how does it work? It has a similar property where like it, uh, the measuring device reads out the names of one of the basis vectors with various probabilities. And how do you know what these probabilities are? One way you can do it is just think of writing the state in the basis of, uh, that you care about. And so it has you know, different coefficients in these bases, beta 1 through beta d. And then it's like you know, the probability that the readout is the ith basis vector is the squared magnitude of beta i. Um, <clears throat> so what is another way to write this uh, beta 1? I just want to remind you, if you have psi and you're wondering, hey, what is this coefficient? Uh, on, on the, the first basis vector. Well, psi and u are both like um, unit vectors. So this beta is the projected length of, of psi on u, u1, you know, up to sine. So in other words, it's this. It's the inner product of oops, the basis vector and psi. And on top of that, it's also the cosine of the angle between uh, these two vectors of psi and u1. OK, so these are a couple of interpretations of the, the inner product between two unit vectors. Uh, good, so in particular, just say again, the probability that the measurement uh, reads out i is equal to the square of the cosine of the angle between the true state and the, the basis vector corresponding to the readout. Any questions about this? OK, so let's do an example. Um, yeah. So the simplest example is uh, qubits. We'll do that. And our favorite uh, example of an orthonormal basis, which is not the standard one, 0 and 1, is the plus or minus basis. So let me remind you with a picture. This is a two-dimensional plane. This vector, 1, 0, is what we call 0. This vector, 0, 1, is what we call 1. And this vector at 45 degrees is what we call plus. And this vector at minus 45 degrees is what we call minus. OK, so plus and minus do form an orthonormal basis. They're orthogonal. So you can build a device which measures in that basis. And uh, so I'll draw that little device like um, this. But I'll put like a plus or minus in the corner to remind you that it's supposed to be measuring in this alternate basis. So uh, what happens if we fire you know, a particle whose state is plus, which again, just to remind you, is this, 1 over root 2, 0, plus 1 over root 2, uh, 1, into such a measuring device. Well, you need to write plus in the plus or minus 1 basis, 
which is uh, the plus or minus basis, which is straightforward. It has all its amplitude on plus. OK, and so this thing, well, you know, this is like the readout. It'll report plus with 100% probability. OK, and when the thing actually comes out, it's still in the plus state. But for example, on the other hand, what if we put a particle in state 0 into this? Well, I mean, to think about what happens there, right? we should imagine how do you write 0 in the plus or minus basis. And you know, by symmetry, you know, it's, it's clear that's sort of an equal superposition of plus and minus. And the magnitude of those uh, equal superposition coefficients is going to be 1 over root 2 again. Or we can use this formula, right, which tells us this coefficient. It's the, it's the inner product or the dot product between uh, plus and 0, which is evidently 1 over root 2. I'll just write this here. So this is kind of an opposite version of this formula. Oops. Okay, if you like, you can also just plug in the coordinates for this and expand it out to check it. OK, and so therefore, when you uh, do this, the readout here, which will either be plus or minus, these will both occur with probability equal to the square of 1 over root 2. So both coefficients are 1 over root 2, which is a half. OK, so it'll 50-50 readout you know, that it measured it as plus or as minus. And then it'll change to either plus or minus the, the state of the particle after it comes out based on what the readout was. Okay. Uh, so there's a cool illustration of that, which I kind of like half did in the last lecture with this, like the 3D glasses and the laser pointer. I brought all this gadgetry in again if you want to try it, but the laser pointer is out of batteries. So if you have two AAAs and want to try this experiment, then you know, put up your hand and I'll give it to you. Uh, otherwise, just, batteries. yeah, all right, great. You want to pass this like back to in the direction of Dave, and then anybody that wants can like hold on to it. You kind of need two pairs of hands to do this experiment. Uh, I managed it in my office after like 20 minutes of trying like to hold it like this and with my teeth and stuff. Um, great. So uh, what is this uh, little experiment? I said it in words last time, but I'll draw it on the board because actually we're going to consider sort of an extension of the experiment also in this class. So uh, in this little experiment, you have this polarizing filter that's like horizontally polarized. And you also put in this uh, vertically, uh, vertical polarizing filter. And you, here's your laser pointer. And it fires, well, some photons in, into here. OK, and remember, how does the, these polarizing filters work? They kind of, so. These guys both, the effect that they have is two part. First, they do a standard measurement. They measure the photon's polarization in the 0, 1 basis. And then after they do the standard measurement, it's kind of like a little if then. Uh, for the horizontal one, if it measures it to be horizontal, then the photon goes through, 0 in other words. And if it measures it to be vertical, then like somehow like heat is generated and the photon you know, turns into heat. Okay, so. The photons coming in, you can think of them as sort of being randomly uh, polarized. So basically, at this point, any photons that come through, first of all, are going to definitely be in the state um, 0. And basically, you have 50% intensity. You know, if you were to just put this on a screen or on a piece of white paper or your finger, like you'd see 50% of the brightness you would normally see if you just fired the whole laser, laser pointer. And then you see this one has the property it measures in the 0, 1 basis. And so it's definitely going to get 0. But it also has the property that when it gets 0, in other words, horizontal, like it, it eats it up and generates heat. So in this experimental setting, like nothing comes through to your screen at the end. You have 0 brightness here. OK, that's really easy to check with the laser pointers. You can do it. By the way, like the, the two eyes there are both horizontal. So to get the vertical one, in this case, you literally turn it 90 degrees. So right now, with these two filters, uh, you know, no photons get through. But there's an amazing thing where you like actually interpose another object in the middle and suddenly somehow brightness gets through, which seems counterintuitive. Uh, and what you do is you can Im 
interpose like this uh, diagonally polarized filter, which like amazingly you also get just by literally turning the, the, the piece of black plastic 45 degrees. And this is exactly like sort of the, the plus or minus uh, basis measure. So it also like, um, it measures in the plus or minus basis. And if it gets a, a minus, it turns into heat. And if it, so it gets a plus, it passes through. So now the scenario, right, is the, the, the photons coming through here are always in state 0. And then we exactly analyze what happens here. Uh, there's a 50-50 chance that you get plus or minus. Okay? So if you get minus, then you turn into heat. And if you get plus, then you fly through. So anything that managed to get through is in the state plus. And now we're at like 25% brightness. Because it had a half chance of getting blocked here, half chance of blocked here. But now finally, the last thing that happens is like you measure plus in the standard basis, the 0, 1 basis. And there's a 50% chance that you measure it to be 1. I mean, the, the measurement outcome is 1, in which case it again flies through. And it's definitely in state 1. And that happens with another 50% chance. So you actually get like 12.5% brightness out of this. OK, so if you manage to hold everything in the right way, uh, you, know, you can get 0 brightness when this is not here. But then you stick the diagonal lens in the middle, and you get some brightness. Any questions about it? Yeah? When it goes to the first filter, doesn't it get rid of the, um, I guess, the light component? Um, yeah, so I didn't quite say how this is modeled, but perhaps you can imagine it modeled as a, a qubit with amplitudes alpha and beta, where like alpha and beta are like random. So if you could pretend that these uh, amplitudes were real, which we like to do, although really they're complex, then like you, could, you would think of that as like uh, you know, a vector which is at a uniformly random point on this circle. And then it's not hard to see that like in that case, the probability of that such a guy getting uh, measured to be 0 when you measure on the standard basis is 50-50. Uh, but then yeah, whenever you're measured, you're either 0 or 1, and it passes you through if you're 0, and it, it turns you to heat if you're 1. OK, so uh, now I want to actually tell you about this funny story, uh, the elitzer weidmann bomb. It's kind of an extension of this. And it, it illustrates some interesting points in quantum, even though it's uh, a bit goofy. Uh, it's from a paper in the early 90s by Elitzer and Weidmann. And it uh, is about the following scenario. So okay, it's, a, it's a goofy scenario, but it's actually going to reoccur for us when we talk about other topics like quantum money. Uh, let's say some uh, mysterious person hands you a box that is opaque, but uh, I guess it has maybe two slits in it, one for incoming photons and one for outgoing photons. And you know that this box, the contents of it, which you can't see, are in one of two states. So in one state that I'll call dud, uh, there's nothing in it. It's just like an empty box. Okay, And so therefore, if you put a photon in, just exactly that photon will come out. Or there's a bomb inside. And it's a funny bomb. Uh, so what's going on? It's a bomb with the fuse attached to like a horizontal filter. Horizontal polarizing filter. So here is the picture in the bad case. There's your filter. And then like there's a fuse. And somehow I can't draw a bomb, but there's a bomb attached to it. Okay. And what, the point of this is that uh, you know, when the, the photon comes in, the thing happens. This measures it in the standard basis. And uh, if it's 0, horizontal, then the photon just flies through as normal. And if it's 1, you know, I said that, you know, that the photon doesn't come through and it generates a little heat. And then we assume that the heat is enough to like, you know, light the fuse, and then the bomb explodes. Okay, So basically, what I'm saying here uh, is the, object, the box in this case measures in the standard basis. OK, and then um, I'm writing this poorly. If uh, it's 0 is the, the measurement outcome, then it passes through. 
And if it measures it to be 1, then it explodes. Okay, so this mysterious stranger has given you this device. And what's your task? Your task is you're trying to decide if it's empty or not, if it's a dud or a bomb. And naturally, you do not want uh, to explode. <laughs> So uh, what's interesting here is that like, if you only use quote unquote classical strategies, then there's basically nothing you can do. I'll put this in quotes because maybe it's not exactly clear what it means if I say, oh, you can only use classical ideas. But you know, basically, if you didn't know anything about superpositions and you just thought every photon was either 0 or 1, then you'd be like, well, I mean, I could send in 0. You know, I could prepare a horizontally polarized photon and send it in. But like, if it's the dud, then a zero will come out. And if it's a bomb, then a zero will come out. So you get no information by doing this. Or you could send in a one, but I mean, basically, <laughs> you'll explode if, if, if there's a bomb in there, which is bad. Right? So that's, that's bad. Kaboom. OK, so what are you going to do? Well, of course, now that you know about quantum states and qubits, you have a quantum idea. You can send in a superposition. And uh, how about just send in a photon in the state plus? OK, so let's figure out what happens. Uh, well, actually, not this, but send in a, state, a photon in the state plus, and uh, assuming you don't explode and a photon comes out, I want you to also measure the outcome. Well, OK, then measure the photon in the plus or minus basis, assuming you don't explode. And uh, let's try to figure out what will happen. I'll draw a diagram kind of similar to this one. Okay, so there, there are two cases. Okay, so case one, case thud. Well, you send in the plus, nothing happens. It comes out as a plus. Then you measure it in the plus or minus basis. And as we know, you'll measure the, you know, your measure will read out plus with 100% probability. Okay, so that's straightforward. Your final readout, you won't explode, is uh, plus. Always. OK, so of course, the slightly more interesting case is what happens if there's a bomb. OK. Well, uh, it's like this. Uh, oh, no, it's like, OK, it is what it is. You, you put a plus in here. OK, and this thing measures in the 0, 1 basis. OK, so. There's a 50% chance it's going to be uh, 1, and then it'll explode. That's, that's sad. But um, OK, so this is measured in the standard basis. Sorry for all the abbreviations here. You'll get used to my abbreviations. Um, you know, there's a 50% chance that you get a 1, and hence explosion, which is bad. But there's a 50% chance that it's measured to be a 0. Okay. And in that case, it flies through. And remember, the last thing I asked you to do in that little two-step algorithm is to measure it in the plus or minus basis. And what happens when you put a 0 into the plus or minus basis measure? Well, you see right there. So then in this case, final readout is um, plus with probability a half, but it's also minus with probability a half. And this is kind of helpful because at the very end of the day, the photon comes out, you don't explode, luckily, and then the measure readout is minus then you know for sure it's the bomb, right? Because in the dud case, the measure always reads out plus. 
So what is the summary of this story? I'll say the summary in words. Okay, if there's a bomb, you have a 50% chance of exploding, which granted is bad, but it's better than 100%. And furthermore, uh, you have a 25% chance of not only not exploding, but like knowing for sure, like successfully detecting that there's a bomb in there. And the remaining 25% chance is when like this happens and this happens, and then it's inconclusive. Okay, so you have 50% chance of exploding, 25% chance of inconclusive, but 25% chance that like you successfully detected the bomb and no explosion, which is pretty cool, right? I mean, that's, that's pretty cool. Sometimes they call this fancily um, uh, interaction-free detectment, which I don't know, I guess arguably it is. But it's, you know, better than you could do if, if you could only send in classical bits. And in fact, to make it a little more entertaining, we'll see later in this lecture that actually you can prove this to a situation where uh, you have like a 99.99% chance of detecting a bomb when it's there without exploding. So it's, it's, it's almost perfect. Okay. So uh, that's sort of the end of the story on uh, measuring for now. And we're going to talk about the other crucial component of quantum mechanics and quantum computation, which is just manipulating or transforming the state of a bit without measuring it. Okay, so measurements have the property that they kind of take a quantum state and convert it to like one classical bit of information. But we also want to just like manipulate the quantum state and leave it a quantum state too. Okay, so in other words, in quantum computing, it's not like enough, so far we've talked about like initializing bits and like, you know, measuring bits, which is sort of the last thing you do. But we haven't actually talked about computing with them, like intentionally changing their state in a way of our own designing. So that's what we're going to do now. So I have to just now just tell you some, you know, facts about physics, facts of life. Uh, in a particular, we'll start in our, you know, most basic simple scenario which is that um, you have, uh, let's say, one qubit. It's in a quantum state. And I will further imagine that like, that one qubit in a quantum state has real amplitudes, as I like to always pretend. So you have some uh, qubit in some quantum state. And you can really think of, in this case, like one qubit with real amplitudes. It's being defined by like one parameter, the angle of this vector from the zero axis. So here is a fact of life. Uh, for any uh, theta, you can build a physical device uh, that does the following to a qubit. It like rotates its state uh, by angle theta. And let me add in, the, in words, as a caveat without writing it, it has this uh, behavior assuming that the qubit state has real amplitudes. Okay, so you can you know, pick your favorite angle, like 30 degrees, and then you can build a little, then for any way you're implementing your qubit, you can, at least in principle, build a machine which, you know, you do the machine to the qubit, and the effect is that the qubit state rotates by 30 degrees. Okay, so it would take this qubit to, you know, this qubit. This is 30 degrees. Okay, and for any angle between 0 and 360 or 0 and pi, 2 pi, you can build such a machine. Okay, and how you actually physically do it depends on how you're physically implementing your logical qubit. Um, for example, at a high level, if uh, you're implementing it with like polarization of a photon, then you can like pass the photon through like a slab of quartz where the width of the slab is some function of theta. Uh, and it'll have this effect. Or if you're storing your qubit with like an ion trap, which I don't know what it is, then uh, you like fire a laser at the qubit for some amount of time where the time amount depends on theta. Okay. Yeah? What is this like without reducing the strength of the signal? Strength of which signal? Uh, like, because like the polarization cuts the amount down, right? Uh, well, in this story with the, light, the glasses and the things, uh, intensity there really basically meant like literally number of photons. 
Here I'm just talking about one photon. Like if you have like one photon representing one qubit, there's no notion of intensity. It's just uh, assuming it has real amplitudes, which we like to pretend, its state is just defined by some angle, like this one. And I'm just telling you, there's like physical, you know, if you pass it through like a piece of quartz of a certain width, it, that'll have the effect in a perfect world of uh, rotating its angle by 30 degrees. Okay, and this is like an operation on uh, qubit states or a transformation on qubit states. And, you know, it's natural to try to describe it mathematically. And I guess you probably know how to do it. It's, you know, the transformation that takes, you know, a little length one uh, vector in two dimensions and rotates it by 30 degrees. That's a linear transformation. And it's defined by a matrix. It's the matrix cos theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cos theta. Okay, let me uh, use this notation for this matrix. Actually, it's bad notation because it's standard in quantum to use this notation for a different transformation. But I was so attached to like R standing for rotation that I, I decided to go with it. Okay, so uh, you know, just to remind you about matrices, right? Like one way to think of it, like a two by two matrix. This is an operation on two dimensional vectors. If you want to know what it is, like uh, this column is where uh, one zero goes to, aka zero, and this column is where you know one goes here. And if you just imagine multiplying this matrix by this column vector, you get this column, and similarly over there. Okay, so indeed, like this transformation takes the one zero vector to cos theta sine theta. So right, this is this, and then if this is theta, then this is cosine theta, and this is sine theta. Okay, and uh, you know, the, two minutes ago I was kept muttering about like how we're assuming that the amplitudes are real, but let me just say in general when they're complex amplitudes, the definition of what this operation is, like what happens when you put it through that slab of quartz, is it's just it's multiplication by this matrix. Okay, so whatever that does to complex amplitudes, fine. Um, good. So for example, I mean, I'll just do even like a concrete example. Uh, you can build such a transforming device with theta being 45 degrees, or pi over four if you prefer. And then uh, that matrix looks like this. Uh, one over root two, one over root two, that's where zero or goes, and uh, go over there, so minus one over root two, one over root two. Okay, so um, this is the effect that it has on a qubit state, like multiplication by this matrix. And in particular for this one, uh, what is the name of the vector that this goes to? Plus, yeah, it goes to the plus vector. Okay, so if you have a photon in state zero, and like you know it's in state zero, and then you're like, man, I really wish it were in state plus, fine, you, you build this device, R45 degrees, and put the, the photon into it, or the particle into it. And then if you had it in plus, and you're like, oh wait, I actually want it to be in state zero, well, just pass it through R negative 45 degrees, which you can also build. In fact, just uh, this is like a little bit of a side note, but um, you see, now I'm kind of just telling you that if you want, you can build this like rotation operation in physical reality for your favorite angle, theta. And um, at the end of last class, I told you, oh, you can build a measuring device for any orthogonal basis. I, I let you do that too. Now that I'm allowing you, in some sense, to build these rotation transformations, I could go back and disallow you from measuring in any basis and say you can only measure in the standard basis, you know, the very first kind of measurement. Because, you know, I'll just do this a little quickly, you can simulate measuring in uh, any basis by doing some rotations and some standard measurements. So let's say, for example, just to illustrate, you want to simulate measuring in the plus minus basis. Okay, so you're in your lab, and you're like, you really want to do some experiment where you measure a photon in a, the plus minus basis or a qubit in the plus minus basis. And you're like, shoot, I left my plus or minus measurer at home. 
But like, luckily, I have a standard measurer, and I can build all these rotation transformers. Then what do you do? Let's say, uh, right, let me make this more general. Let me make this u and v. OK, so let's say this is u. And then v has to be perpendicular to it. It has to be an orthonormal basis. That's v. And uh, you know you have some particle. Maybe you don't know its state, but anyway, it's in state psi. And you want to measure psi in the uv basis, but you don't have that measuring device at, at hand. So what can you do? You just say, all right, let me say this. You know, you know u and v. You say, let this angle be u. So you'll like pass, you know, your particle you're measuring through uh, r theta. Uh, no, I think I want, oh, uh, yeah, thank you, negative theta. Because the mathematical convention is that like uh, rotations are counterclockwise, and I want to rotate clockwise. So I need to do minus theta. Thank you. OK, and this has the effect that u moves to 0, and v, I mean, just mathematically, moves to 1. And then you do the standard measurement. But you don't write down what you see on the LCD screen in the readout. You write down something different. So the particle comes in to your standard measurer, and the LCD screen says either, you know, maybe it says 0. But then in your notebook, you don't write down 0. You write down u. Okay, you treat that as, oh, I measured u. And of course, if it's 1, you treat that as if you had measured v. Okay? And say, supposing this happens, then you know that the qubit in actuality comes out in state 0. Because in actuality, it was measured to be in state 0. But then you, you're trying to simulate this measurement, so you have to put it back into state u. OK, so like 1, 2, sorry about this, 3, you know, put the, out, put the particle through uh, r theta. OK, so that simulates it. Yep. Uh, so in physics, yes? is there is actually like a notion of the 0 and 1 state for the particle, or this is just some basis that we picked for our first measuring device we ever built? And like, yeah. The latter, I guess. I mean, you start with, like, I guess, some physical device, which is affected by the particle and, in a sense, measures it and like registers two outcomes. And then you just call those outcomes 0 and 1, and you start drawing your picture so that like 0 is this way and 1 is this way. OK. Great. So uh, that was a little side thing. So now I told you this fact. You know, in, uh, For qubits, you can build a physical device that does any rotation operation you want. You might say, what else can I do? What else is physically allowable according to the laws of quantum mechanics? Well, another thing that turns out to be physically allowable according to the laws of quantum mechanics is uh, you can also build a reflection operator through any line. Just to save letters, I'll call it a reflector. Well, I'll call it a reflection. Okay. So uh, you can, you know, think of your favorite axis. Let's say, you know, this is a nice axis, the 45 degree axis. And you can build a physical device, which when you pass the qubit through it, it has the operation of, uh, you know, flopping its, its state uh, reflection in this axis that you have. So this would be the new state. Uh, in coordinates, that means, you know, if the state was initially had amplitudes alpha and beta, then the amplitudes of the new um, uh, state of the qubit would be beta and alpha. This is specifically for this 45 degree one, of course. This 45 degree one has the property that it reverses the coordinates. OK, and again, like if the amplitudes are complex, like just this would be the definition of what it does to the complex amplitudes. But like this is the picture if they happen to be real amplitudes. OK, so uh, in other, other words, this operation, like the most mathematical way to say what it is, is it's defined by multiplying by this 2 by 2 matrix. Uh, which 2 by 2 matrix? Yeah, 0, 1, 1, 0, right? Because again, how do, you, how do you come up with this? The first column is the coordinates of where 1, 0 goes, which is here, right? Uh, 
0 goes to 1. And then the second column is where uh, this vector, 1, goes, which is 1, 0. And that goes to 0. OK. Right, so um, yeah, you know what this gate, sorry, you know what this operation is called? It's called the not gate, yeah, the quantum not gate. So I might probably accidentally start calling these operations gates uh, because the main thing we're going to do in this course is build like little circuits out of them, quantum circuits. And then by analogy with the usual Boolean circuits, these little operators are called gates, like AND gates, OR gates, NOT gates. This is called the, the not gate. OK, but geometrically, it's reflection of the qubit state through 45 degrees. Uh, quantum people also, for some weird reason, call this gate X, capital X. Not too happy about that, but eventually you have to get used to the fact that they may say that to you. Uh, let me give you another example of a reflection. It's actually an incredibly important example. I'll try to redraw here. Really got it. Okay, good at circles, that's quite bad. Um, let's draw the axis that's um, the reflection axis, which is 22.5 degrees, or uh, pi over 8, or halfway from the, x -axis, the horizontal axis to the 45 degree axis. Uh, this is a very popular one. Let's see where it sends vectors. So this, this 0, where does it go to? It gets reflected across this, so it guts up to 45 degrees. So it goes to plus. And where does 1 go to? Uh, right, it goes 45 degrees, and then another 22.5, so then another 22.5, another 45 degrees. So it goes to minus. OK, so you can think of it uh, this way. And actually, once you know this, you can just write down the matrix for it. Uh, Put plus in the first column, which is 1 over root 2, 1 over 2, and minus in the second column, which is 1 over root 2, minus 1 over root 2. OK, and this is the, this is the operation, the transformation, multiplying the qubit state by this matrix. This is probably the most famous operation in quantum mechanics and in quantum computing. It's uh, denoted H, and this stands for Hadamard. So this is called the Hadamard gate, or operation. Uh, if you know a little math, if you take away the 1 over root 2, so it's plus 1, plus 1, plus 1, minus 1, it's called the Hadamard matrix. Um, yeah, it's super important. Uh, this is also the matrix which does the Fourier transform of like a two dimensional vector. So this is also the discrete Fourier transform matrix for two dimensions, or like one qubit. So it's another reason why it's so important. Uh, okay. Uh, all right, so I said you can do any rotation you want, and I said you can also do any reflection you want. Uh, what else are you allowed to do according to the laws of quantum mechanics? Um, again, if there were no such thing as quantum amplitudes, uh, which is something we like to pretend, then actually that would be it. Uh, but there are quantum amplitudes, so in fact, you can do even more things. I'll give you an example of something you can do. Uh, this is called the phase shift operation. And I'll just say the matrix which defines it. It's 1, 0, 0, i. And I guess it's most commonly denoted s. OK, so this uh, is an operation you can do to qubits. And what does it do? Well, if you multiply it against a qubit with amplitudes alpha and beta, you get alpha and uh, i times beta. Okay, so it gets some complex numbers in the picture. And one thing I just want you to check while we're staring at this is, right, this had better be a valid qubit state. And what does it mean to be a valid qubit state? Well, you should be a two-dimensional vector, and the sum of the squares of your magnitudes should be 1. Well, let's check that. Alpha squared plus i beta squared. It's the same as alpha squared plus beta squared because the magnitude of the complex number i is 1. And then this is 1 because this was a valid qubit state. OK, so it, it makes sense. Uh, 
Good. Remember the Simons uh, phrase encapsulating quantum computing, rotate, compute, rotate? We saw that like the first operation was like rotations. And then I said, oh, you can also have reflections. But I want to tell you actually a reflection is a kind of rotation, arguably, right? I mean, it's not at first, but like if you allow yourself the third dimension, then you know, a reflection through this 45 degree angle is a rotation, right? You just take this and rotate it in three dimensions like that. And I think perhaps it even is like a rotation in two complex dimensions, because like technically there are two more axes here, right, for like uh, the complex dimensions. So I like to even think of uh, reflections as rotations, just maybe in a slightly higher dimension. So to me, slangily a little bit, reflections are also rotation. And I think even this is like a rotation too, like a complex rotation or something. I mean, it's you know preserves the length of the qubit state, and if you do it four times in a row you get back to the original state. So it's some kind of 90 degree rotation, I think, in complex dimensions. Okay. Um, yeah, so all I want to say is that um, if you're a little bit liberal with your definition of what a rotation is, then in fact, there's a sense in which all of these things are just uh, rotations of a vector. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. So uh, in the case of reflection, it's kind of different from rotation, because rotation is a continuous symmetry, while reflection is uh, well, I think I know what you're saying. You're saying that like, uh, you know, reflections are discrete and rotations are continuous. Maybe I'm not sure what you mean because like, I mean, a 30 degree rotation is like a discontinuous thing. It starts looking like this and then it looks like this. Now you might say, well, there exists like a family of rotations that kind of slowly moves you from like doing nothing to doing 30 degrees. This is a very good point. Whereas for a reflection, you know, you're like, it doesn't feel like there's like a family of reflections or something which slowly take you from here to here. Um, but actually, if you kind of picture a reflection as a rotation, like here through the third dimension, then there is something that you can do that like literally three-dimensionally rotates, you know, this until it's like this. Mm. So we're going Maybe. Into the complex You're kind of going into the complex dimensions, exactly. To, so in fact, it is, can be continuously, I'm going to mention this at the end of class, you can kind of continuously do some things that eventually have the effect of a, rotation, a reflection by using complex numbers. And in fact, you know, I told you like, uh, you know, for some of these things like, uh, well, let me just leave it there as like a little uh, story. We'll come back to it at the end. but like. Yeah, we're going to actually eventually ma imagine like what happens if you do this 3D rotation to affect your not gate, but stop halfway through. I'll leave that to the end of the lecture. Do you have a question? Yeah, so when we define a rotation as like multiplication by this matrix, right? Yeah. What if the question is, can we simulate all of this when theta could be complex? Yeah, uh, let me just. I'll say things more formally in a minute, but like just take my word for it. Like for each of these uh, matrices, two by two matrices I've written, there exists a physical, you can build a physical device, which when you put your qubit into it, has the effect of multiplying the qubit state by this matrix, even if that qubit state has complex amplitudes. No, 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 no. My question is different. So basically, like here you're arguing that even though like reflection seems to be different, it's still kind of rotation in like a high dimensional space. My question is that can you write that matrix as the rotation matrix, but f instead of using the real theta that we use there, you use a complex theta? Uh, I leave that as an exercise for any math PhD students that may be in the room. <laughs> yeah, not joking. Um, yeah, it's even a little unclear how you define like angles when you have complex vectors, but. Um, I mean, you can plug a complex number into cos and sine for sure. So that's, I indeed leave it as an exercise for you. I think you need quaternions. <laughs> oh, wow. There's a very nice 3B1B video about this on YouTube. <laughs> Link to it in the description. Uh, OK. So I, I do want to exactly get to the formal math of like, you know, all of the you know, transforms that quantum mechanics allows you to do. But like, let's go back to the bomb for a second. The uh, let's sort of Weidman bomb for fun. Um, so you remember that bomb, right? I mean, uh, basically, it looks like this. There's either nothing inside, or there's this like horizontal measuring device. It measures in the 0, 1 basis, and explodes if it gets 1, and it passes it through if it gets 0. And we said, oh, it, you know, don't just pass in 0, because like, whether or not there's a bomb or not, you'll just get 0 out. And then we said, well, we'll pass in plus, 
And that helped us, but it was like an immediate 50% chance of exploding, which is not great. So uh, now that we know a little bit more of what we're allowed to do, let's do something a little bit more gentle. Uh, let's pass in uh, a qubit whose angle from the uh, horizontal axis is epsilon. Or epsilon is some small number that we'll choose later. Okay. So I'm actually going to start describing a little algorithm for how you can deal with the elitzer weidmann bomb. I should draw the bomb in the corner here. Okay. So uh, here's the algorithm. Start, you know, initialize a qubit to uh, state 0. And then apply this rotation operation to it. Build this r epsilon and apply it. Okay. So now at this point, let me try to reuse this diagram. Uh, the state of the qubit now is here, where this is epsilon. Okay. And then send it into the box. Okay. And let's find out what happens. At this point, we'll do two cases. Case dud, when the, the box is empty, well, it just flies back out. So the qubit exits in a state uh, where the angle is epsilon. So let me just say at uh, angle epsilon. OK, in this whole story, the qubits, the photon we have, is always going to have real amplitudes and just we'll define it by its angle from the horizontal axis. OK, so what if there's a bomb? OK, so in case bomb, it's actually not so scary because you know, this, this starts out in a state which is very close to horizontal, so it's very likely to be measured as horizontal and therefore not explode. Um, so good. So case bomb. Uh, so what is the probability? Remember, the first thing that happens is it's measured in the standard basis. So what's the probability that you measure horizontal? Can somebody tell me the exact? Yeah, cosine epsilon squared. Okay, it's always the square of the cosine of the angle between the, the state and the measurement outcome you're talking about. And that's very close to 1. Uh, and then if this happens, like, um, you know, 0 exits. OK, but you could also measure 1. And that's when that happens, you explode. So let's just say the probability you explode is the probability that you measure 1, which is the remaining probability, which is sine theta or sine epsilon squared. This is very small. Uh, as you know, sine epsilon has a Taylor series. It's like epsilon minus epsilon cubed over 6, maybe, plus epsilon the fifth over 120 or something. Uh, all I'm saying is sine epsilon is actually at most epsilon. It's very close to epsilon when epsilon is small, and it's, it's basically epsilon. So this thing is at most epsilon squared. Okay? And this square is very important. Like, you know, if epsilon is 1 in 1,000, angle of 1 in 1,000, then this is like 1 in a million. This is like way smaller. And that's really great. I mean, that's a small chance, so we're happy. Uh, good. So. Let's assume that we, we do these two steps, and then like we do not explode, and the photon flies out. Then you know, put a couple of mirrors around to like change the photon's you know direction, and uh, just pass it through that theta or epsilon rotator again, and put it through the box again. So in fact, you know, presuming the photon comes out, you don't explode. Just repeat this, and uh, repeat it n times, or n is 90 degrees divided by epsilon. Or if you like radians, pi over 2 over epsilon. OK. Uh, so I guess what I really mean is, first choose a very large integer n, and then define uh, epsilon to be uh, 90 degrees over n. Whatever, pi over 2n. So this is how you actually, you know, handle the Elitzer-Weidmann bomb. Choose a big number n, set epsilon to be 90 degrees over n, 
Then repeatedly do this. Take a photon, rotate it by epsilon, put it in the box. Then whatever comes out, rotate it by epsilon, put it in the box, and repeat. All the while hoping that you don't explode. Um, OK, so now what happens when you do this full algorithm? Uh, if it's really the dud, then after n rotations, what is the state of the qubit? Right, the state of the qubit is angle 90 degrees, aka 1. Okay, and then uh, case bomb, what is the final state of the qubit assuming you never exploded? Zero, zero right, yeah. Final state is zero, assuming you don't explode. Because in the bomb case, whenever the qubit does make it through, like it's because it was measured to be zero, so it comes out as zero. Great, and what's the probability that you explode over the course of the whole algorithm? Well, you do this whole thing n times, and each time you have at most an epsilon squared chance of exploding. So it's n times epsilon squared. Uh, right, and epsilon is like a constant over n. So epsilon squared is a constant over n squared. In fact, this is at most, well, it's equal to pi squared over 4 over n. Okay, so it's like 2.5 over n. And that's amazing because you can set n to be whatever you want if you have the time. If you have, if you have enough time to like do this a thousand times, set n to be a thousand. And uh, your probability of exploding is 2.5 over 1,000. It's like a quarter of a percent, which is great. And not only that, uh, let me add one more step to the algorithm. Uh, you know, final step, just measure in the standard basis. OK? And so when you measure in the standard basis at the end, assuming you don't explode, if it's a dud, you always get 1. And if it's a bomb and you didn't explode, you always get zero. Okay? So by looking at what you measure, you know if it was bomb or dud. Okay? So you basically perfectly solve the problem. Uh, assuming you don't explode, you know 100% exactly right whether it was the box was empty or had a bomb. And you can like tune the probability of your own explosion to be as low as you want. You, know, you can make it 2.5 over n uh, if you're willing to play this game n times. So, pretty cool. Any questions? Yeah, how did that happen? Like, is this epsilon square, it just like happens to be because, I don't know, just because the problem statement? I don't know, like, the only thing, the only reason why this algorithm works is because, you know, every time you repeat, like, of course you sacrifice time, but then the probability is somehow is square, right? And this is from the funny definition of, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, this is like actually a really, it's, this is a really good illustration of like how quantum computing or how like exploiting the laws of quantum mechanics lets you get like a cool improvement over like classical, using like classical laws. And in fact, it's, this is going to be quite reminiscent of this thing called Grover's algorithm, which is like a famous quantum algorithm. That thing really exploits, you look at that, the analysis at the end, and you're like, like somehow just like a square saved you. Like a, like a squared thing got canceled with a non-squared thing, and like that was due to the laws of quantum mechanics, and somehow that like boosted up your algorithm in a really cool way and let you solve SAD in square root 2 to the n time rather than 2 to the n time. And uh, yeah, that's the beauty of using the laws of quantum mechanics to help you solve your problems. Is there a question yet? Yeah? Uh, what was the initial condition for like the final algorithm? Like what horizontal? Oh, you initialize it to zero, horizontal. And then you slowly like rotate it. See, after a while, after you're like halfway through this algorithm, you, the experimenter, have like no clue what state the thing is in. If it's a bomb, you know it's like rotated like, you know, k epsilon if you've done it k times so far. And if it's a dud, it's like definitely still zero. And um, you just set things up so that, like, when you stop, it's either 0 or 1. And you can perfectly tell the difference between those two. Uh, this one was bomb. This one was dud. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think 
the cheating actually lies in uh, lies in the energy transfer. Because in the real world, every time there's a little bit of energy transferred to the fuse. It's just not enough to sort of set it up. Um. Because you're well, the uh, the filter actually rotates the quantum bit like the quantum bit for you, right? So in yes. that case, there has to be a transfer of energy, like physically speaking, but. Uh, probably. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that's not enough to set up the bomb. So you're sort of distributing the, the entire energy that's that set up the bomb into tiny portions, um, which are not, each not enough to set off yeah. the bomb. Yeah, but they are collectively enough to like change yeah, the state. Yeah. But you're yeah. doing it in steps, so it's Yeah. Have there been any energy loss for a single photon? Yeah. It just goes uh, at the same speed always, and so it can't lose energy, right? I don't know anything about physics. <laughs> yeah. It's not losing energy because there are rotations like a, a mathematical thing, so it's not actually physically rotating anything. It's just like a, a representation. Yeah. yeah, but for it to lose heat, it has to slow down. And yeah, and it doesn't, so it's not. No, 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 like the frequency changes. I think, yeah, yeah. physically it's speaking, something like some kind of transfer has to happen. It's a time reversible mm -hmm. operation, so there's no energy loss. Okay. Yeah, I think if we consider it a closed system, which we is how we're modeling it, then it is reversible. Well, there's a measurement though. No, the the the, the polarizing filter constitutes a measurement. So, let me summarize by saying I don't know. Uh, according to like the mathematical formalization, which uh, we're using, which people use and is supposed to model reality, this is the story. Oh yeah, the problem is. Yeah, do you have a comment? Well, I just wanted to say, like, in terms of measurement, like, you, you could have a measurement set up where it, one result does, uh, has it lose energy and one result doesn't. Like, if you have two particles with spins in a magnetic field, uh, one, like, maybe it's a sensor, but it uh, uh, veers one way and the other way it veers into continuing on. So you now know, okay, well, continued on, so it, it's measured, but it didn't, it's like the polarizing. Yeah, that's exactly how I'm imagining, right? Like, if it, if it measures one way, it goes on. If it's measured another way, it hits the sensor. But like, how exactly, like what happens when the photon like doesn't pass through and somehow causes heat to be created? That's beyond my understanding. Yeah, that's the story. But like, does it like interact with some particles that are inside the polarizing filter? Like, I don't know. <laughs> okay, Let, let's take this up, uh, you know, it, after, uh, after class. I still have to tell you about uh, allowable quantum transformations. So this is quantum mechanics uh, law three, and it's usually stated earlier than the one about measurement, but it, it says like according to the laws of quantum mechanics, how can a particle state change over time? Uh, and it says basically this, a qubit state uh, can, put a little asterisk here, uh, be changed by any linear transformation that preserves length. So I'm going to elaborate on this phrase for a while. Okay. Uh, right. So I'll elaborate on this, but let me say uh, what I mean here and a little bit on this asterisk. The, according to the laws of quantum mechanics, any linear transformation that preserves the length of vectors is allowable in the physical world, and therefore you like, can, in principle, build a physical device which effects this change. Okay? In practice, if it's a very complicated, you know, it's like a high dimensional state, and like maybe it's a quote unquote complicated uh, linear transformation that preserves lengths. It may be physically hard to build this device. And in many ways, the whole field of quantum computation is about measuring and trying to understand the complexity of how hard it is to build things which affect your favorite linear transformation that preserves states. But any such one is in principle allowed by the laws of quantum mechanics. I can additionally say that the fact that these transformations that are allowed have to preserve the length of the vector is sort of obvious. It's like almost like by definition, right? Like the state of a qubit by definition is a vector of length one. So if you're like a transformation that you know acts on a qubit, you must preserve the length. I mean, you must output something that has length one. So the quote unquote restrictive aspect of this you know law is that it has to be a linear transformation in the sense of linear algebra, 
right? It has to be basically a matrix multiply. Okay? So the set of all allowable you know, quantum transformations, the ways in which qubit states can change or be evolved, um, putting aside measurement, is, uh, which is a separate thing, is by uh, linear transformations that preserve length. Okay? Now, uh, you will say, well, which are the linear transformations that preserve length? This is a question of pure linear algebra, which matrix multiplies have the property that they don't change the length of the vector. And um, intuitively, right, these are like the, kind of like the rigid motions, right? Like all vectors of this length have to move to like a vector of the same length. So like rotations certainly have this property. And reflections certainly have this property. And basically, that's all. I mean, all, it's a little bit uh, funny when, again, like these are complex vectors. You're not used to like, what does a rotation mean and so forth. Again, had we only been talking about real vectors, then it would literally be the rotations and the reflections. And uh, those linear transformations are collectively called orthogonal transformations in linear algebra. Uh, and the analogous thing when you have complex vectors are called uh, unitary transformations. Okay, so this is a word you'll hear a billion times when studying quantum uh, mechanics, unitary transformations. So simply the complex analog of orthogonal transformations, which means transformations which don't change the length of the vector, which in the real case means rotations and reflections. And as I tried to say before, a reflection is itself kind of like a rotation if you allow yourself some extra dimensions to w wiggle through. So more slangily, it's like rotations. Okay. But now it's time to enter into a little linear algebra refresher. Okay. So we're going to talk for a little while about these things called unitary transformations. Okay, so these are precisely those linear transformations u, you can think about u as a, a matrix if you want, uh, such that, uh, well, for all vectors psi, it holds that the length of u psi is equal to the length of psi. Okay, that's the definition of a unitary transformation, or a definition. Uh, it's nicer if we just put a square here. That's the same thing. Because the square of the length of a vector is its inner product with itself. So uh, what I'm saying here, this is equivalent to uh, the inner product of psi with itself. We like to write it like this, the row vector of psi times the column vector of psi. And we can do the same thing here. This is a column vector. So we can get its squared length by multiplying by the associate row vector or the conjugated row vector. In other words, by the dagger of this vector. So we want to multiply here by, or we want to have this, u psi dagger, conjugate transpose, times u psi. Okay. Uh, the transpose of the product of two matrices is the product of the transposes, and the conjugation goes through. So this, this thing is uh, the bra version of psi times the dagger of u conjugate transpose of u times u times psi. Okay, okay so uh, u is unitary. If this equation holds for all column vectors uh, psi, this is like an inner product. This is like a row vector times a matrix times a column vector. And one thing you could note is this equation would certainly hold true if I only draw this implication one way. This would certainly hold true if u dagger times u happened to be the identity matrix. Okay, if that were true, then this would be the identity matrix. Multiplying by the identity matrix is just nothing. So you just get uh, bra psi times ket psi. As it turns out, this is not just an if, but it's an only, if and only if. Okay, if, uh, this equation holds for all vectors psi, then it must be that u dagger u is the identity matrix. It's not too hard to prove, which is why I put it on your homework, which is out now. Uh, okay, so this is an equivalent condition, and this is sometimes the textbook definition or the definition you'll see if you look up unitary on Wikipedia. It'll say a matrix is unitary if u dagger u equals identity. 
And uh, so they're equally good definitions. By the way, what does that look like? If u uh, is a matrix with columns, little u, then what is its dagger? Its dagger is got the rows, uh, same vectors as rows. Well, you should also complex conjugate them, but there's that. And then apparently, uh, you know, this product should be the identity matrix, which looks like this. And just imagine in your head for a second multiplying these two matrices. Well, to get the top left entry, you multiply this row by this column. That's like the dot product of u1 with itself. And apparently, that's 1. So uh, the condition says, in particular, that the first column has to have length 1. And actually, this 1 comes from doing the second row times the second column, which is u 2's inner product with itself. So we also need that u2, the second column, is a length 1 vector. In fact, all the columns should be length 1 vectors. And what about the zeros? Well, these are the inner products of pairs of distinct u's. So if you think about it, what this equation is saying is that, um, well, the columns of u are an orthonormal basis. Normal basis. OK, I mean, it's d vectors. They're all pairwise orthogonal, and they have length 1. OK, so in fact, u, capital U, you can think of it as a change of basis matrix, right? I mean, again, like the, if you have just a matrix, like how do you interpret it? The first column is where the first coordinate axis vector goes, the first unit uh, vector goes, the second one is where the second one goes. So this is like the change of basis matrix that takes like the standard basis and moves it to some other basis, the basis whose uh, vectors are the columns of capital U. So it's like a change of basis matrix, like a rotation or maybe a reflection. Uh, good. Any questions so far? Uh, let me just tell you, like, just I'll now tell you a collection of facts about unitary matrices. Uh, right. So it's this is uh, one way to define the condition. Uh, it's a fact of linear algebra that if a times b equals the identity matrix, then b times a equals the identity matrix. It's actually not so easy to prove, but in this case, it is easy to prove. So being unitary is equivalent to u u dagger equaling i, if you like. And this is also equivalent to just multiplying. Uh, I mean, this is saying that like u has an inverse, and it's u dagger. So u has an inverse, and it's u dagger. So that's another way to say that u is unitary, is to say that its inverse is equal to its conjugate transpose. Right. Those are all equivalent conditions for being unitary. Is it possible to physically emulate any unitary transform we can come up with mathematically? Yes. That's sort of what quantum mechanics law 3 is saying. Yes. There's a caveat that in principle, which is that like, it may be physically challenging, like if you design, uh, you know, on a piece of paper, a, like 1,024 by 1,024 unitary matrix, and now say, hmm, I want to like build a device that will implement this transformation on 1,024 dimensional space, which is the state of 10 photons. I want a box that takes in 10 photons and does this 1,000 by 1,000 matrix to them. It may be physically challenging to build that, uh, but for any such matrix, it is allowed and, in principle, doable by laws of quantum mechanics. But exactly the, you know, doing that thing I suggested is exactly sort of asking about the quote unquote quantum circuit complexity of, in some ways, it's about the quantum circuit complexity of um, implementing a, you know, 1,024 dimensional unitary matrix. I should say that from what I understand in physical reality, for all the common ways of trying to implement a physical qubit, I believe that these days they're really good at implementing one qubit gates, so like two dimensional unitaries. Like you can write down any two dimensional unitary and they're like very good at like physically building the device that does it. And that's kind of the limit. I mean, they're, they're uh, no, I mean, I think they're pretty okay at maybe like making like a 4 by 4 unitary to your specifications, but this is like the barrier of where it is right now, from what I understand. Uh, good. Here's another fact about unitaries, unitary transformations. Unitaries 
I'll just write it briefly like this. Unitaries also preserve angles. So I told you that they preserve the length of a vector. They better do that. They also preserve the angles between any two vectors if you simultaneously do the unitary to both. In fact, I mean, if you put that together by the formula for inner product, which is length of the first guy, length of the second guy, cosine of the angle, is this, this, the same, this is the same as saying that they preserve inner products. Okay, so this is actually kind of an upgrade to the fact that they preserve length. They also preserve inner products. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'll just write the proof, which will explain it. Um, if you have any two vectors, phi and psi, uh, and you do u to both of them, so you do u to phi, and you say, hey, what's the inner product of that with u done to psi? Well, that's the inner product. OK, and again, like, how do I dagger this product of u and phi? I get the bra version of the row version of phi, u dagger, u, psi. And then this is the identity matrix, since u is unitary. So it goes away, and you just have phi inner product with psi. Okay, so this is what it means. Whatever the inner product between phi and psi was before, it's the same after you do the unitary. In particular, the angle between phi and psi does not change. Okay? Actually, this is sometimes taken as a definition area of unitary as being unitary as well, that it preserves angles. But it turns out you can prove that for linear transformations, preserving lengths implies preserving inner products. Okay, uh, better leave that. Let me erase this. Oh, well, I erased the exact one thing I wanted to save, which is that u inverse equals u dagger. In particular, what that means, I'll rewrite it, is that unitaries have the property that they're invertible, which is, uh, you know, not every linear transformation is invertible. So that's, that's nice. In fact, every unitary u is invertible. And in the context of quantum mechanics, people like to also call this reversible. Well, I guess it's the same meaning. Every transformation u that you can do has an inverse. I guess I should add that's also unitary. This follows from the two lines here that I just erased. So I'll rewrite them. Uh, by definition of being unitary, u inverse is u dagger. And u dagger is unitary when u is because you know, it satisfies this equation. Because the dagger of daggers is the, the original thing. OK, so that's kind of nice, actually. It means that like any uh, quantum operation that you can do, you can also, in principle, do its inverse. So uh, let me just remind you of some unitaries we already saw. I mean, it's basically just writing down some rotation gates and things and reflection gates in, for qubits that we already saw and looking at them and saying, yep, it was unitary. But you know, just to remind you. Um, so here's some examples. Uh, on qubits, allowable transformations on qubits, which are in C2, we had uh, this. Rotation matrix, cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta. That's something allowable. I guess the easiest way to see that this is unitary is just to recognize that, well, it's a rotation matrix. Uh, well, that, that works well if it's real amplitudes. I was going to say, and therefore preserves lengths. I guess you can also just check that the columns are orthogonal, right? Uh, the inner product of the columns is negative cos times sine plus cos times sine, which is 0. And cos squared plus sine squared is 1. So they're orthonormal. Uh, we have this most famous one, the Hadamard uh, matrix, which I'll bring out the factor of 1 over root 2 and write like this. Okay, That was reflection through 22.5 uh, degrees. That's the unitary. Uh, we had um, the knot gate, which looked like this, 0, 1, 1, 0. And we had this um, phase gate, which is like 1, 0, 0, i. I guess as I write these, just remind yourself, let's say, that they all satisfy this equation, or that their columns are orthonormal vectors. 
Uh, there's another gate called z, or another operation called z, which looks like this, 1, 0, 0, minus 1. That's kind of similar to s in a way. Um, I'll write a couple more. Uh, let's say you have a Q-trit. Then here's an allowable operation. It's a 3 by 3 matrix that is, I claim is unitary. 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. Right, the columns here are, form an orthonormal basis. They're pairwise orthogonal and of length 1. In fact, this is just a permutation matrix. So if you think about how its operation, every permutation matrix actually is unitary. How does it act on a qubit state, like, uh, or sorry, a qtrit state, alpha, beta, gamma? Well, it transforms it to gamma, alpha, beta, I think. All right, it permutes the amplitudes. And uh, therefore, it's a little check. It's quite clear that it preserves length, right? I mean. Uh, whatever the sum of the squares of the magnitudes of these three things are, it's, it's also the sum of the squares of the magnitudes of these three things. Okay, so that's another way to see that a permutation matrix is a unitary matrix, which uh, is another reason why the not gate is a unitary matrix. So all these things are allowable. Uh, for example, in uh, four dimensions, uh, here is a unitary matrix. It's also just a permutation matrix. And it's physically buildable. And this, this gate is actually used in quantum. It's called the swap gate. And what's the reason? Well, the most common way, as I said before, to have a four-dimensional system is to have two qubits. And uh, you don't name the basic states 1, 2, 3, 4. You name them uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And they're sort of implemented by, let's say, the polarization of two different photons. And if you think about what this does, it um, kind of swaps the two uh, photons. So in fact, the physical operation that implements this is just taking the photons and like moving them like this. So you're just thinking of them in the opposite way. Uh, OK, I'll draw one more uh, four-dimensional one. And then I'll tell you the last story for this class. Uh, one more four-dimensional one, which is very famous is 1 half times this, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1. You can check that this has orthonormal columns. This one is called, for uh, reasons we'll eventually see, h tensor power 2. It's that tensor power of the Hadamard gates. This is what you get if you do this operation to each of your two photons separately. And it's also like the Boolean Fourier transform for functions of four bits. Uh, so that's like a really great uh, operation to do with a quantum computer. OK, the last thing I'll uh, say, which is kind of a fun fact, every unitary u has a square root. It's related to something that Matt was saying. Call this not just a fact, but a fun fact. Uh, what is the square root? It's a transformation, w, such that doing w twice gives u. w squared equals u. Uh, great. So for example, the square root of the rotate by theta uh, operation is the rotate by theta over 2 operation. Okay? If you're doing this by uh, passing your photon through a slab of quartz that's this thick, then you do this one by passing it through a slab of quartz that's half as thick. Or if you're getting it by firing a laser at your qubit, then you fire the laser for like half the time. So then if you do that twice, it's like you full, fired it full the full time. Right, so one thing that's cute is that therefore the not gate has a square root. And classically, this sounds a little crazy, right? This is like some operation you can do to a bit that like halfway knots it. So that if you do that thing twice, it has the effect of switching 0 and 1. Sounds crazy, right? But remember this picture, you know, the not gate for qubits, it's like reflection through this 45 degree angle. That switches 0 and 1. And uh, as I said, don't think of it as a reflection. Think of it as like a rotation in the third dimension. 
And then you can do it continuously. And if you stop it halfway, that's the square root of naught. Okay? And you have to like work out what that is, and like you're really using like the complex dimensions to affect this. But I'll just uh, I was going to say I did the calculation, but I'm not going to lie to you. I just looked it up. Uh, <laughs> square root of naught is uh, this matrix. A half, 1 plus i, 1 minus i, 1 minus i, 1 plus i. Okay? So this matrix is unitary. You can check that its columns, I mean, you have to put the half inside, are uh, length 1 complex vectors, and they're orthogonal, so it's unitary. And if you square this matrix, I mean, just square it up, you get one quarter, and then like this row times this column turns out to be zero, this row times this column turns out to be four, and four, and zero, and well, you get zero, one, one, zero. So this is a, a thing that you can do to a qubit, which has the effect that if you do it twice, you get a not gate. And this is also kind of, um, kind of a justification or explanation in some sense of like why complex numbers. Like this square root naught matrix does not exist if you restrict yourself to real numbers. Like it's clear there's no square root of just like the real transformation which is a reflection. But with complex numbers it does exist. And it's a reflection of the fact that in real life, as was mentioned, you know, the way the qubit state changes into a naught gate is not by like instantaneously switching but by like a time dependent continuous process that takes, you know, after zero seconds, it is what it is, and then after one second, it's gotten into the knot of what it was. And halfway through, it has to be a square root of knot. And that only exists with complex numbers. Okay, so now that we uh, know about measurement and unitaries, uh, we can compute as much as we want on, on one qubit. And so next time, we'll talk about more than one qubit. <laughs>